Welcome to the Destiny Church Tees Valley podcast. As you listen, it is our prayer that you are transformed by audacious faith, inspiring hope, and extravagant love. Make a choice, take a stand, and change the world. That was the three messages that came through on that video, wasn't it? Here we have a man whose heart was broken for his people. His heart was moved. He had a burden in his, on his life. He had a compulsion for a cause that drove him to do what he did and, of course, thousands of other people as well. And as you know, we've been going through this season called Living Beyond Myself. Because that's the whole point. Martin Luther King Jr. lived for something beyond himself. He put himself in danger. He put his family in danger. He put those who fought his cause in danger. There was no soft option, but they were willing to pay the price for the cause, for what broke their heart. My question today is, what breaks your heart? We've gone through this series, and uh, we had Kath start us off. And uh, what did she talk about? She talked about the sword and the trowel. And she brought out a humongous sword and a giant trowel. We were all ducking low when the sword came out, weren't we? But she was talking about Nehemiah. She talked about, obviously, about doing DIY jobs and all that things. But she talked about Nehemiah. Nehemiah's heart was broken for the wall of Jerusalem, for Jerusalem. When his friends came, his heart was broken. Then we had Nadine the week after that. And in the Living Beyond Myself series, she talked about, what did she say? Towel over title. Do you remember that? And so she talked about that, about being a contributor, not a consumer. And talking about apathy will destroy your destiny. What a powerful phrase to use there. And she talked about John chapter 13, about Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And uh, she, she, uh, we acted it out, didn't we? We had Emma up here, and she was getting her feet washed, and Nadine just was going through pretending to wash her feet, and then left her to dry her own feet. <laughs> I shouldn't talk about her, should I? Now I know she's there, but anyway... No, but, but, but the issue was, is just think about this, Jesus' whole life was based on living for a greater cause. His heart was broken for the sin of the world, and so as a result of that, he was willing to do something about it. He didn't just change the channel. He didn't just say, I'm going to pray for them. He didn't just have a devotion about it, yes? He didn't just kind of talk about it. He did something about it. Now, I don't know about you, but I know people that have what they call a bucket list. It seems to be a bit of a kind of thing these days, isn't it? Now, I don't know what's on your bucket list, but I've heard all sorts of things. Now, I want to say to you, I wonder how many people on their bucket list had what Nadine talked about, about what Jesus did on his bucket list. What is the things you want to do before you die? Well, Jesus was about to die. And so what did he do before he was about to die? He washed the disciples' feet. He served. Mark 10, 45 says he came not to be served, but to serve. That was the mission of Jesus. He had come to serve the Father. He come to save you and me. The only way you and I can ever serve God is through serving someone else. 
That's the only way we can show the love of God is through loving other people. That's how we do it. That's how we show our devotion to God. Our devotion needs to have some motion attached to it. And so Nadine talked about that. Jesus' heart was broken for us. Ben, he talked about serving out of our identity. Is that not right? And David and Goliath and, and the whole thing about David's identity and who he was. I want to say to you, David's life was lived out in serving God, in serving others. It says of David, even when he was on the run, he was gathering people around who were discouraged, who were despondent, who were in debt, who were in distress. He had people come to him, and he made them into a phenomenal army. He made these guys, they were some of the most fiercest, um, but became the bravest of men and women around him. Yes? Why? Because his cause wasn't about David becoming king, and yet they all wanted him to become king. Now, why did they want him to be king? Because he was not trying to serve himself. It was life was not all about David. David's life was all about the purposes of God. What was God's plan for his life? Even when David had an opportunity to take the kingdom, he could have been king in, an, in, in, in a moment when he was in the cave of Adullam. He was there and him and his, and his men were at the back of the cave and Saul came in to relieve himself. And when he came in, David snuck up because the men put him up to him and said, God, now's your chance, now's your chance, David. Now you can become king. But instead, he just got there and he cut the hem of his garment because he realized he was going to do something his way. Instead of God's way, he understood that he was a servant of God. He understood that he had a cause, but he wasn't, that being king was not the cause. Being king might be part of the plan, but it was not his life's identity. And so, David's heart was broken. What was he broken with? Well, when we saw Goliath, what was it? He was broken because they were defying God. He was broken because he wanted to please God. He wanted the people of God to do that. So that's what Ben did. Then Tracy, the power of everybody. Talking, you know, about team, about working together, and the, the, the Ezekiel, about the valley of the dry bones, and how we need to prophesy over it, and it came into being, and, and, and there became an army through it. And she talked about the body, and how the body is, is intricately made, and how we need each part, and, and how just one little part in our body can affect the whole of our body. Is that right? What's the whole point of the body? Every part in the body is to serve other parts of the body, isn't it? It's to serve others, to be able to... So the whole point of that, so in other words, the finger is not there for its own benefit. It gets benefit when it helps the body, when it helps other parts, and it, and it kind of goes like that. Do you know what I mean? And, 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 and well, no. Whatever, the, 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 the body... <laughs> Kath's looking at me going, no, did he really do that? Well, I've got to keep your attention somehow, haven't I? But so, uh, so, we, we, so she went from that. In other words, the key is, is to get on a team, get part, get serving, get, get involved in what, uh, in what God is doing. And, um, and so that was important. Faith talked about serve, don't swerve. That's right. In other words, keep to the task that God has for you. Yes? It's about making yourself available, being faithful. Stop making excuses. And about the, God, the way that God has designed us with a shape. And remember, she went through that, didn't she? And talked about the importance of that. And I want to say to you, what she was saying was, is God has designed each one of us so that we can serve in a particular way. And so God, God is saying to us, I've given you a heart, I've given you a passion, and I've given you the gifts and the abilities to fulfill that passion that I've put within you. In other words, what does your heart break for? God has said, I've gifted you, I've made you, I've shaped you to be able to do that, to accomplish that. <clears throat> and so this week, I want to kind of tie them together a little bit and, um, and bring out the whole aspect 
of what breaks your heart. Yes? Now, you might be thinking, well, I don't really know what breaks my heart. I'm not really sure what breaks my heart. Well, hopefully, then at least today, you will start to think about what breaks your heart. That you'll give it some thought and think, what is it that, that concerns me? What is it that bothers me? What is it that's, that happens around us that, that's in my world? What is it that I see? What is it that, that I'm aware of uh, that, that concerns me? but I'm maybe doing nothing about. I just change the channel. I just think, oh, I can't do that. I, who am I? I'm, I? I haven't got the gifts. I haven't got the talents for that. I haven't got the time for it. I haven't, whatever it is. And so out come the excuses. Yes, which is what Faith was talking about, about that. So it's, it's, there's always an excuse. Yes. Whatever it is, you're too old, you're too young, you're too middle-aged, you're too <laughs> whatever it is, you, you're too something or other, yes? You're too clever, you're too whatever it might be that, uh, for, for it. But let me just ask you a question. How much of your thinking goes into, how can I make myself a better person? How can I be better? How can I, yes? Well... I don't know if you're anything like me, but I put a lot of thought into that, yes? I think to myself, how can, how can I be better? Me. And it, 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 a lot of it resolves, revolves around myself and about, about what, what, what concerns me, yes? Um, <clears throat> so I want us to think about, rather than what's in it for me, or how do you think, is to think, what about the things that are around me? How can I have some concern for the people around me, the concerns around me, the things around me that I can, that I can make a difference and, and, and do it from us. Now, one of the things that we've got to understand is that, uh, <coughs> that, that it's good to have self-development. Yes? Because some of you, I can see, you need to lose weight. Some of you maybe are in debt and you need to get out of debt. That's good. But if you make that the cause of your life, Nobody's going to be impressed. No one, or not one of us, are impressed when we get something we think, oh, they got, this, they got out of debt. We might be thinking, oh, that's good. But none of us are going, that is the dream of my life. I, I, you know, if everybody was like that, yes? Or, so, you know, you lose weight and we think to yourself, they're a model of perfection. But what we do remember, what we do um, uh, look to, the people that we look to, the people that we tell our kids about are the people who have lived beyond themselves. People who have lived for something, a greater cause rather than just for them and their family and what's in their little world. We brag about people and we look and it goes around the world, it? whether it's Mother Teresa and what, she's, what she did. You know, you, you look and you think to yourself, why? Because she lived beyond herself. What is it when we look at the Moses Project and we look at Brian and Stella? What is it? We're not, we're not looking at how their uh, such bodies are such beautiful. Uh, they, we are looking at the cause that they're running for. Yes? We're running with, they're running with a cause, and it's that we go, wow, they're achieving something for the kingdom of God. So that's what I'm saying is we've got to ask ourselves what inspires us. Well, the things that inspire us are people who live for other things. The problem is it's so easy to blame other people. To blame other issues, isn't it? We see something and we say, oh, well, it's the government's fault. Or it's the school's fault. Or it's Fred Blogsby's fault. Or whatever it is. We've always got, it's never our fault. It's never our problem. It's there's, there's a problem. And what we look at is we think, right, well, somebody else needs to deal with this. So what we do is we blame people. If you blaming people never changes anything. So no matter how much you blame the government, it's never going to change the issue. Yes? Doesn't matter how much you blame the school system, it's never going to change it. The people who change it are the people who get involved in it. The people who do something about it. The people who speak up about it. The people who are involved in that. And the issue is, is that if you are a Christian, the world should be a better place because of you. 
if you are a Christian, something around you needs to be changing. Something should be changing as a result of your life. Because that's the whole message that Jesus gave about, he said, about his disciples, that you would do even greater things than I do. And wherever Jesus went, there was change. Wherever Jesus were, there were miracles. There was, there was the feeding. There was all sorts of things happening. Lives were changed. People were learning things and understanding things that enabled them to live differently. They were, Jesus was doing something, and that was the, the message that he gave to his disciples. Go into all the world. Make disciples. Do something. What he's making. Making is doing, isn't it? He isn't just sitting there. It's not blaming others. It's not, you know, don't say go uh, into your family and just consume everything on yourself and get as much as you can and sit on the can and make sure nobody else gets hold of the can. Do you know what I'm trying to say? That is important to us. And so, unfortunately, we often don't um, do that. Often for us, we are, <clears throat> one of the things I think, particularly as Christians, that where we suffer with is the problem of thinking that if we have had our devotions or we're living a devoted life, that that's enough. Living a life of devotion is good, but the whole point of it is that it will bring motion. It will actually, there will be some act, there will be something changed as a result of the devotion. And uh, so, unfortunately, too often people in church think that actually, as long as I believe the right things, as long as I believe uh, the, the, the things and I act in the right way and I've got to the end of the day and I've not blown it, I've not done anything stupid and, uh, and whatever, then, you know, and the problem is, is that all that people see is a, is a church that's maybe doing the right things, saying the right things, but they're not seeing how that affects them. They're not seeing how, that, how the love of God touches them. <clears throat> they're not seeing how your faith makes a difference to them. They're just saying, well, you, you, you're just coming across as holier than, than me. You're just coming across that you know it all. You're just coming across that. And, and that's not the point of us. <clears throat> you see, God is perfect. He is perfect, full stop, yeah? He's sinless, he's without sin, he's never done anything wrong, he's completely perfect in every way. And God is forgiving and he's merciful. Now let me ask you a question. In your life, what is it that you're most thankful to God for? Because he's perfect or because he's merciful? Are you more because of what God knows or because of what God does? Do you see what I'm trying to say? Because God, he didn't just say, oh, my heart's broken with the sin of the world. He didn't just say, okay, never mind, just blow him away, let's just start again. His heart was broken, so he sent his only son into the world so that we could know forgiveness, so that we could no relationship with him. He did something about it. And God's call to us is to do something about the things that we see, about the things that break our heart. So what is it that breaks your heart? God has designed you, as we heard last week, he has designed you so that your heart will break for something, so that there's a passion in your heart for you to serve the church you, you know, you need to be serving in your connect group. You need to be serving in the church corporately, in the ministries. You need to be serving in the world. You need to be serving in the community. You need to be serving those around you because we are servants. We sang, we've just sang the song, Servant and King. What is Jesus known as? He's known as a servant. That was the title that was given to him, as a, as a servant. That's how important it is for us. And yet we think most of our time about <clears throat> ourselves all the time. Paul put it in different ways, but one of the things he talked about was is because we so often look at it and we put ourselves in a pecking order. We think I know more than them or I'm, 
I'm, I'm, you know, in, a, in an elite class or I'm kind of, whatever it might be, we do that. And Paul said to them, he says, you know, some people think I'm a Roman, so that's better than not being a Roman. Um, you know, being Greek, that's kind of uh, lower. I'm a slave master, which is better than being a slave. And so there was all these things. And Paul just turned it on his head because he was, he was using what Jesus' life had always demonstrated. And that was that everyone is precious in the sight of God. Regardless. They're made in the image of God. You don't have to be a Christian to be precious to God. Yes, you, 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 just, you just understand that actually we are all made in the image of God. God loves everyone. And God has got a plan for everyone. Now, whether they decide to do that or not, that is the, 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 the question that we can do. But, but everyone has done it. What is the church's message been for the past 2,000 years the church has been involved in showing the love of God to everybody. It hasn't just shown the love of God to certain people. It hasn't just shown the love of God to Christians. It hasn't just kept things. When it's built a hospital, it hasn't built a hospital just for Christians. It's built a hospital for everyone. When it's built an orphanage, it hasn't just been for Christian orphanages. It, it builds a church. It builds a, an orphanage for everyone. If it's, if it's building a shelter for the homeless, it's for all the homeless. That's the same with Brian, isn't it, Brian? It's for everyone. Oh, you have to be Yorkshire. <laughs> but do you know what I'm trying to say? It's for everyone. Why? Because it's the love of Jesus. The love of God compels us to go, to do something about what we see. So whatever it might be, whether it's a medical mission trip, whether it's building a school, whatever it is, God wants our heart to be broken for those that are made in his image, for everyone, yes, everybody. So it's not just everybody in a team in the church, but it's everybody in the team knowing that the mission is for everybody, that we're trying to reach everybody. Everybody is precious in his sight. It's so important for us to do that, yes? And, um, and so I just want to want to say that... Um, I'll just go back to Nehemiah quickly. Um, <clears throat> Nehemiah, when when he, he heard the news about Jerusalem and when he had his friends come, he did a number of things. Chapter one's powerful chapter. He, he prayed. He spent time with God. He, you know, he, he fasted. He spent some time trying to get, get word from God what was going to be. And so we, we don't know exactly what went on in that in, in his prayer time. We do know what he said, some of the things he does. He's repenting of his sin. He's repenting of the sin of his nation. He's repenting, uh, you know, of, of sins and uh, putting himself right with God and wanting uh, his people to be right with God. And, uh, and so we know that. But when he comes to the king and he's, and he's serving wine to the, to the, uh, to the king, <clears throat> when the king asks him why his face is downcast, why he's looking sad, which could have been the death penalty in all fairness in, in, the, in that culture. But when he was asked, he didn't just say, oh, well, I don't know, I'll, I'll think about it. He had a plan. He knew, and he said, well, now you mention it, this is what I could do with, and he, he kind of reeled off what he wanted. He had a plan. He'd prepared. He'd done the devotion. He'd done the seeking God's guidance. He'd done the planning. He'd done all the kind of things but he was, he was setting up to do something about what broke his heart. He was getting ready for when he's at. And the thing is, what I like is at the end of the chapter, after all the process of God, it just finishes with this one line that, that it says, and it just says, I was cupbearer to the king. I was cupbearer to the king. In other words, this is who I am. This is what I do. This is where God placed me. This is the resources that I had to hand. This is, this is all I have. There's the burden. I don't have the, the, the power. I don't have the resources. Don't have the thing. But God's placed me here. He's put a burden on my heart. And somehow I know God is going to come through. In other words, he didn't use being a cupbearer as an excuse for becoming a builder of a wall. 
He didn't say, no, I'm an administrator. I'm the one that kind of, I'm, I'm good at uh, checking that the food's okay. I'm not just a, a protector to the king. I'm not just in this kind of sphere where I'm up there and the people that we need to have is down there. He went himself to serve the cause. And that's what God is requiring of us. He's saying, I want you to be burdened with what I put in your heart. What is God stirring you up about? What is it that maybe that you put to one side? What is it that maybe you're thinking, I could never do that? You know, maybe you're thinking to yourself, oh, you know, I'd love to be involved with the children's work, but I, I'm, I'm hopeless with children. I don't know how to relate to them. I don't know. But there's so many ways to be involved. You could be doing administration. You could be planning games. You could be preparing stuff. You could get in materials. You could be going uh, around the doors and giving leaflets. You could be designing leaflets. There's so many myriad of things that you can do if you've got a heart, if you've got a burden for what God wants you to do. That's my question. What is it that breaks your heart? What is it that breaks your heart? It is important that we do that. Whoever devotes themselves to themselves will have nothing but themselves to show for themselves. I'll read it again. <laughs> Whoever devotes themselves to themselves will have nothing but themselves to show for themselves. That is really a paraphrase of what Jesus said. Because Jesus said, if you live for yourself, you're going to lose yourself. But if you live for me and the cause and the, what I put in your heart, then your life, you will gain it. Your life will be full. Your life will be abundant. Your life will be prosperous. Uh, will be prosperous, it will be fruitful, it will be effective if you do that. Now, the problem with this <clears throat> is that by nature, this goes against our nature. Because my nature and your nature is naturally to be a life preserver, a life saver. We all do it. That's our natural bent to do that. And that's not necessarily wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong. I mean, Jesus himself, he fed himself and looked after himself and washed himself. There was, you know what I'm trying to say? There was things that were, things that were going on. But if you just live for yourself and there's nothing outside of yourself, if there isn't a greater cause, then you're going to have problems. And so <clears throat> I, I'm the same. I'm a life saver. By nature, life saver, life preserver. In other words, I have locks on my door. I lock the windows at night. Um, you know, the, a lot of the things that we do, I, I save money when I'm allowed to. <laughs> so we have all sorts of things that we do, yes? It's natural for us to want to save, to keep, to hoard, to, to make sure we're okay. I'm, you know, m part of my, my life is looking after the girls and, and protecting them and, and loving them. And you know what I'm trying to say? But if all that ever happens is that I live my life around me and my family and what I have, then my life is going to be nothing. It's going to be worthless. It's going to achieve nothing. Because God has created each one of us to live for something greater than ourselves and on our own families. And the re Luke 14, Jesus says this. It's really quite, a, 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 in some ways, an awkward passage, certainly when you first read it. And he says this, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Woo! Now, I think the first thing to say is that, that when you first read that, you think, hang on a minute. Jesus is saying we need to hate people. We need to hate the wife. Or the children, or whatever, you know what I mean? You, you, you do, is that, no, he's not talking about the emotion of hate. He's talking, he's talking about the fact that who's going to be boss? Who's going to call the shots? If your mum and dad call the shots in your life, you, you know, then you can't be my disciple. If um, your brother or sister 
call the shots. If your wife or your husband calls the shots, if they're the boss, if they're the supreme, and that's what Jesus was saying is, I have to be Lord. I have to be in control. So to be a disciple means to follow. To follow the disciples, certainly in them days, they understood the term disciple. They understood that actually it meant that you were devoted to that person. And you followed their teachings and you did what they said and you went where they went. But unfortunately, too often, we are like the crowds that followed Jesus. Now, there were big crowds that followed Jesus. Um, you know, I don't know what them crowds were like, whatever. They followed him all over, whether they ever washed or shaved or whatever, I don't know. And they could have been quite smelly, but they followed him. And then Jesus kind of comes in with this and he says to the crowd, you know, that you can be a traveling companion, but you don't fool yourself. You're not my disciple if you are not doing what I've asked you to do. You're not my disciple if you're listening to other people and to what they are saying when I have asked this of you. And so God is saying, I put a burden in your heart. I have put something in you that your heart breaks for, and I want you to follow me in that. Not just whatever... Uh, you know, think, oh, I fancy doing something about this, whatever, but praying about it, like like, like um, Mabel was saying this morning about getting in the presence of God and, and just spending time with him because it's out of that. That's what Nehemiah had. He spent time in the presence of God because until you've got the presence of God, you don't have the power of God. But when you've got the power of God, you can fulfill the purposes of God. It's the purposes of God that we want to do, but so often we can try to do the purposes of God but we have got to be in the secret place. We've got to be in that place where we're spending time with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are devoted. We are having our devotions, but out of our devotions, they should bring motion. They should bring something that we are wanting to do, yes? So in other words, it's not about self-improvement, and it's good to have self-improvement, and I think some of you look like you could do with a bit of self-improvement. So it's not, it's not that we don't need some self-improvement, but it's about self-denial. You've got to say no to some things in order to be able to say yes to God. There are some things that you're going to miss out in life, some missed opportunities because you're saying yes to God. There are some things that you're not going to be able to do because you're now focused on what God wants you to do. You know, when we looked at Selma and we looked at Dr. Martin Luther King and some of the things, there were things that he couldn't do because of what he decided to do. When you say yes to God, you are automatically saying no to other things. The question is, is who are you going to say yes to? Are you going to say yes, Lord? Or are you going to say no, Lord? Well, you can't say no, Lord. It's a bit of a contradiction, isn't it? You can't say no, boss. Some people do, because we're used to that at work, aren't we? Sorry, boss. Can't do that, boss. Busy, boss. But you can't do that with God. You can't say, I'm sorry, I'm busy. I've got other things. I've got agendas. I've got goals. I've got relationships. I've got, I've got responsibilities. God is saying... I put a burden in your heart for you to reach out. Just show the love of God. God is loving, lo looking for us to do that. Now, so often we are looking for the big things. Now, the big things do come across sometimes in our life, the odd occasion in our life. We might get one or two big things maybe to do in our life, but the majority of things that God has planned for us are little things, are small things. I want to tell you, that small things done with great love will grip, grow a great church, will grow a great life, will give us what we're looking for. That's why when Jesus says, come and deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, he was not just saying, I want to, I'm wanting you to be, to be down and I'm wanting you to kind of your life not to, to, get, to have a lot of meaning. Actually, he knew that actually when you give up one, then you take up his plan that your life is an abundant life. Your life is a full life. Your life is a productive life. It's a meaningful life. It's a life of purpose and of destiny. The question today is, what breaks your heart? Amen. If you would like to know more, please visit us at www.thedestinychurch.co.uk. 